This is a download from the BBC. To find out more and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk. Mark Twain once said, Age is an issue of mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. Radio 4 has relatively few listeners under 34. Does that matter to radio schedulers and strategists like Radio 4's Dennis Nolan? About half of all listening to Radio 4, in terms of the number of hours listened to, is by people over 65. I'd have to say that our absolute priority is to focus on the very demanding expectations of the older audience. More from Dennis Nolan and a specially convened listeners panel later. And the calm before Vivaldi's storm. How best to fill those awkward intervals in Radio 3's live concerts? My feeling is that when you give that sense of event to the audience who've come to see the concert tonight, you will also be doing the right thing by the listeners at home. But first, the BBC ship has a new captain on the bridge. He left 12 years ago as plain Tony Hall and returned this Tuesday as Lord Hall of Birkenhead. A crossbencher, ennobled because of what is widely regarded as an outstanding period running the once-troubled Royal Opera House. He calmed the turbulent waters of Covent Garden, but such storms are as nothing compared to the tsunamis that periodically smash into Broadcasting House. Seemingly undaunted, the new Director-General chose the scene of his predecessor's career suicide, or was it murder? The Today Studio and its Inquisitor-in-Chief for his first broadcast interview. As you would expect, John Humphreys interviewed his new boss with great respect, indeed, deference. I can then tell you whether the money we've got is too much, too little, but well, I doubt it'll well, be Well, you've that. got a pretty or, clear or idea. Whether... You've been thinking about it for many months now. You were in the organisation. The thrust today. of the new DG's message was that, yes, the BBC had had a difficult time recently, but that it had learnt the lessons of the Savile Affair and was now intent on winning back the public's trust. Tony Hall also talked of the need for BBC management to foster excellence and creativity. Now, there's a novel idea. Management is a creative, or should be a creative uh, profession, where you are enabling people to do great things. A catalyst. The new DG got a sympathetic ear from most feedback listeners, but some were less than impressed with the interview itself. I'm Rob Bancroft from Bridgewater in Somerset. I was appalled at John Humphrey's interview with Tony Hall on this morning's Today programme. It wasn't so much an interview as a one-sided rant from John Humphreys in which he occasionally allowed Tony Hall to comment before interrupting his answer. What the future of the BBC looks yeah, like... Yeah, but you're ducking in, the question about um, money. In, you're, in you're 2022. You're, you're, now, you're, when I've done that, John, when I've done that, John... I thought Tony Hall did pretty well to get his point across because it felt as if John Humphreys had an agenda and he wasn't really willing to allow Tony Hall to make his point. I'm Gordon Petherbridge and I live in North Buckinghamshire. I thought it was a good interview in many ways and certainly Tony Hall acquitted himself well, fending off some of John Humphrey's attacks, if I can put it that way. And obviously he's a highly experienced man in broadcasting and I'm looking forward to him doing a good job, really. Now, I think one of the great... No, no, that's exactly the point. That yeah, is what yeah, they will say, see, but they're but not see, interested in whether <laughs> the BBC grows yeah. and becomes a mega organisation. But where not. I... I prefer... I'm Marsha Hill from London. Much as we all like John Humphreys using this aggressive style when he's questioning people that the rest of the silent majority of the country is angry with, Tony Hall hasn't done anything yet to make the rest of us angry. Our thanks to Gordon, Rob and Marsha for getting in touch. Now, we weren't impertinent enough to ask their ages before recording their comments. We wouldn't want to pigeonhole them in that way. But Radio 4 has been charged by the BBC Trust to attract younger listeners, or what is known in the trade as replenishers, replacements for those heading for the concerts in the sky. But does it need to change to do so? After all, audiences are booming, and many think that listeners naturally migrate to Radio 4 a little later in life. And can it be more appealing to the young without alienating the existing audience, whose average age is 55? In a moment, I'll be discussing that with Radio 4's network manager. But first, here are the views of three listeners at very different stages of life. 23-year-old Catherine Robbins from London, 80-year-old Wendy Sturgis from Surrey, and first, 55-year-old Kim Hindmarsh from Nottingham. My favourite programme is Saturday Live, which no one is allowed to phone me when I'm listening to it. It's sort of like a cornucopia of interesting people and experiences. So it's very easy to listening to, but it's interesting as well. 
Wendy Sturgis, um, you're 80. What programmes really appeal to you on Radio 4 now? Well, I suppose plays, Pick of the Week I Love, the documentary style, anything that you learn something. So it was Out of the Ordinary last Monday, which was particularly interesting, about voices from beyond the grave. And uh, let me then come to our youngest listener, Catherine Robbins, 23. Uh, Catherine, what programme do you enjoy listening to in particular? I listen to The Moral Maze quite a lot. I enjoy the discussion that goes with that. I find it quite an ageless programme, I think, that people, whatever stage of life they're in, can access it in different ways. Well, now, Radio 4, as you know, has been required by the BBC Trust to target the replenisher audience in order to secure the station's core audience in the future. I think that means that as some of the older audience pass away, they've got to make sure there are younger people coming along. And yet you told us that um, a lot of your friends roll their eyes when you say you listen to Radio 4. Yeah, I think it's seen as a fairly stuffy radio <laughs> channel. Um, quite a lot of the presenters are of a certain age and I think that a lot of the programmes are not really directed at my age group. Even I have a problem with the tone of it. Sometimes I'll listen to programmes and I'll enjoy them for the content, but actually the tone of it, it's a bit school marmish occasionally. Well, can I come to you, Wendy Sturgis, who are just a little bit older than Catherine, I think. <laughs> um, do you think that Radio 4, there is the space for Radio 4 to start appealing to much younger people and change its tone, or would you feel very much you wanted to defend it as it is? Yes, I would really rather like to defend it. I think it would just lose its atmosphere, and if it tries to be all things to all people, it might really fail with all ages. Kim, how much... Uh, opportunity do you think there is for Radio 4 to experiment in order to attract a younger audience? Well, I think the difficulty is if you start trying to attract, you've got to change the actual way you attract people. And so what I would hate is all that enforced joviality that you hear on commercial channels or channels aimed at younger people. I think younger people are stimulated by other technology, so they may be Twittering or Facebooking, which I do myself, but I think that's the difficulty, that times have changed. Let's talk then to Catherine about the, the accessibility of Radio 4. So do you think the technology is a problem, that young people just don't find Radio 4 or what? No, I actually don't. I mean, it's it's on iPlayer along with all the other radio programs that I guess you'd normally associate with young people. I think that actually what Kim's saying about not wanting to change it to something maybe more to do with popular culture is actually quite an important point. You know, you say young people, you generalise a whole generation and I don't think that all young people just want to talk about what celebrities are doing and I think that Radio 4 actually has quite a good niche a little later, I'm going to be talking to the uh, one of the top people in Radio 4 about the schedule and what they're trying to do. Do you have any suggestions about the way in which they could persuade people of your own age not to roll their eyes and actually try Radio 4? I suppose that, yeah, it is quite a lot to do with the image of it rather than necessarily the programming. I mean, obviously, there are some programmes which would appeal to some and not to others, and perhaps it's more slanted towards the average age. But actually, I think that... Yeah, it is more to do with the style of it and there's sort of a certain tone that most people who present have. It's quite isolating. And can I then turn to you, uh, Wendy? There seems to be a consensus among our two uh, fellow contributors that don't really alter the content a great deal, work a bit harder perhaps about the way it's presented and the tone. Is that something you would share? Yes, well, I do think younger people will grow into it and I'm not particularly keen on uh, Saturday Live but I still think it's a good thing because people will listen to it who might be then drawn into Radio 4. It might be for a younger audience. OK, coming back to you, Catherine, if you could uh, be the programme schedule on Radio 4, first of all, oh, what would you get rid of? Um, I probably would get rid of Saturday Live. I really, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I really didn't enjoy that very much. Um, but that, then that's a personal thing. It was... I felt it was very focused on a certain age group. I mean, they talked a lot about cremola foam and even said anyone who grew up in the 60s, 70s or 80s will remember this, and that's definitely not me. Kim, Catherine was very disappointed with Saturday Live. Do you think she should try again? Yes, she should try again. It wasn't the best Saturday Live I've ever listened to. Sorry, JP Devlin. But I've never heard of cremola foam either, Catherine, So, and I'm 55. 
Our thanks to Kim, Catherine and Wendy. And those are the views of just three of our listeners. So does Radio 4 think it needs to change to attract those elusive replenishers? Dennis Nolan is the station's network manager. Given that, what, about half of all listening to Radio 4, in terms of the number of hours listened to, is by people over 65, I'd have to say that our absolute priority is to focus on the very demanding expectations of the older audience. And nearly 11 million people listen to Radio 4 every week. Among those younger listeners, the people we call the replenishers, that is, people between 35 and 45, mm. that group has stabilised in terms of listening over the last few years. So we're, we're happy with the way we're doing that. Well, let's pick up uh, some of the comments made by our panellists. I mean, Catherine, for example, although a fan, and you'd be delighted because she's under 24 and she's a fan of Radio 4, did talk about uh, sometimes it being very stuffy and uh, sort of an isolating tone. It was very interesting, that conversation. Uh, what struck me to begin with was that uh, the programme that Catherine picked out as her favourite was The Moral Maze. Who would have thought of that? A programme of high seriousness. So, you know, it's very difficult to predict from age exactly what kind of programme will appeal. And, in fact, there is no significant difference uh, between the different genres, that is, say, comedy, drama, documentaries and news, as to the the type of age group that they'd appeal to. If anything, uh, the younger audience is slightly more drawn to news than it is to comedy. But it is difficult sometimes when you hear people talking about sexual issues of particular interest to a younger generation. And the person who's chairing the discussion is, shall we say, well, even as old as I am. I mean, there's a need to keep ensuring that presenters are in touch with the people, a lot of the young people they're talking to, and the issues they're dealing with. If you have too many older presenters, a younger generation is bound to feel it's your network is out of touch. Well, I don't think it's a question of age. It's a question of keeping in touch. So that's to do with your tone of voice. It's to do with your awareness of a changing culture and to do with just being connected, being contemporary. And, uh, you know, some of our older presenters do that better than anybody else. Uh, Pursuing the theme of trying to retain your uh, existing loyal audience yet extending your appeal, is comedy a way in which you think, a good way, do you think, in attracting a younger audience? And is that behind a lot of the comedy late at night? You deliberately try and target a younger audience and bring them to Radio 4 through comedy. Radio 4 is the home of radio comedy. We have to provide a, you know, a stage for established performers and talent and writers, but we also need to provide places for new talent to emerge. And but you'd not... have to do that anyway. I just wondered whether or not you thought, look, young people, older people tend not to do this, go up to listen to Stand Up, love that. If we bring that across to Radio 4 and give a particular home for it, young people will find that and then they might find the rest of Radio 4. Well, that might be the case. In fact, young people don't necessarily come to Radio 4 through comedy. But, um, yes, you're more likely to find, let's say, you know, an edgy or more experimental kind of comedy late at night than in the morning or at 6.30. And is the aim of that to bring in a younger audience? No, the aim of that is to provide a stage for that more challenging and experimental comedy, which will find an audience right across the age ranges. Our thanks to Dennis Nolan, network manager of Radio 4, And in a couple of weeks, I'll be talking to his boss, the controller herself, Gwyneth Williams, about whatever you ask me to ask her. So please give me my instructions. I hope some of you will be able to put your questions directly. You can write to Feedback, P.O. Box 67234, London SE1 P4AX, or you can leave a phone message on 03 333 triple four five double four standard landline charges apply but it could cost more on some mobile networks or you could send an email to feedback at bbc.co.uk all those details are of course on our website and now the drama series neverwhere which in the view of many listeners is never where you can find it The scheduling of the star-studded adaptation of Neil Gaiman's cult novel had already raised many a hackle because transmission was split between terrestrial Radio 4 and digital Radio 4 Extra. The first episode was the only one broadcast on Longwave and FM. The next five were all digital only. So far so exclusive to many listeners' ears, but it gets worse. We're hopelessly lost. We'll never be seen again. Where am I? Where are we? Top of the post office. Hello, my name is Lawrence Conroy. I'm from Southampton. As Radio 4 Extra is only usable for me on the internet, I was pleased to see that the episodes were available with more than a year to listen to each program. 
that I was not amused when these disappeared with no advance notice. For goodness sake, people, please ensure that your websites tell something at least vaguely correct and consistent. Is this how you people get your kicks? Just leaving people stranded here! Hi, this is Madeleine Stoltz from London. I found it really confusing about the final episode because all the other episodes were advertised as being available for nearly a year. And then the final one, uh, when I tried to have a look at that, it had actually gone off the iPlayer. You know, great series, but next time it would be great if we could all hear the end of it. So, uh, what just happened, Bartram? So, what just happened to those tempting promises of a 12-month window of opportunity to listen again and again? We didn't even have 12 minutes. We invited a representative of BBC Interactive to come into the studio to explain the problem, but strangely, no one was available. We received this statement instead. We are always keen to enable people to hear our programmes on demand for as long as possible, and much of our factual output is permanently available on our website. Unfortunately, we have experienced some technical difficulties with the facility that allows people to listen again to all programmes from within a current series. This has resulted in some inaccurate messages, indicating that programmes will be available for longer than the usual seven-day period after the end of the series. We apologise for the confusion this has caused and hope to be able to solve these technical issues in the next few weeks. Oh, and while you're still not here, listener Pete Ravenscroft has another question for you. Whilst prepping dinner the other evening, I thought I should listen to some comedy on iPlayer. So I picked up the Now Show series, but instead of the Now Show, I had to listen to this. This died. BBC News. Read by Corrie Corfield. Steve Punt and Hugh Dennis are joined by John Holmes and Marcus Brickstock, amongst others, after this. News has become much more like a service industry where constantly... Produce... I had to listen to the end of the news, followed by the entire continuity announcement, before it even started the programme. Back when I was a teenager, I, amongst many, used my new cassette recorder to record shows from the radio. And within moments, I was quite competent at waiting for the continuity announcer to fade out and hit play and record as the theme tune of the target programme started. I used to record John Peel in the evenings when it was too late for me to be awake and I had to do it very quietly. I'll tell you what, you know, I've not done this for ages, but I think we ought to hear that again. Hold on a second, just talk among yourselves. Please train your iPlayer contents recorders to be more accurate with pressing play and record simultaneously. The lead singer sounds like Loud and Wayne Wright at times. I may sound a bit fanciful, but listen to it. Well, apparently, Pete, the method for ingesting, that's the technical term, I believe, radio programmes into iPlayer is a little more high-tech than having a team of people merely pressing play and record. It's done on an automated timer, based on the scheduled start and ends of the programmes. And, as we all know, radio is not a precise science, so sometimes you get a bit extra at the top. But we are told that when the start or end of a programme is inadvertently cut off, they do manually override the system to correct it. Now, one of the great attractions of attending a live concert is being able to discuss it over a drink in the interval, while gazing at the other members of the audience to see what they're up to. But what about when you're listening to a concert at home, perhaps alone, missing out on such on-the-spot experiences, and dependent on whatever the network decides to fill the interval with? When the third programme, the precursor to Radio 3, began in 1946, this is what was offered as the very first interval entertainment. And let's not forget that we have a duty to all our listeners. Nor will you do it by plunging him or her, all unsuspecting, from boogie-woogie to bark. That approach only infuriates. The commanding tones of the then Director General of the BBC, William Haley, not a peer but a mere knight. His speech was thrillingly entitled... The third programme, an introductory talk. Things have livened up a little since then, and Radio 3 now has an array of interval features, from mini-documentaries, short stories, live interval discussions, and even Sue Perkins answering listeners' questions on music. So what do you think makes for an engaging interval? My name's Susan Lester. I live in Middlewich in Cheshire. My favourite interval talks are the live from the Met ones because they're always related 
the interviewers there, so Margaret Juntwaite especially, uh, have such lovely voices and are lovely. That was Act One of Zondonai's Francesca Darini. I do have one suggestion for you, though. During the interval, why not let's wander into the crush bar, put microphones, hidden, of course, and then we could just listen in to snippets of people conversing over their G&Ts. You don't know what you might pick up. I'm Ian West, and I'm living in Northumberland. Well, I think the interval is a real problem. It's almost inevitably out of kilter with the music before and after it. However interesting it may be in its own right, it probably doesn't appeal in the same way. I'm Thelma Edwards. A while ago, I was listening to Live in Concert. During the interval, I suddenly got an attack of the gripes, I'm afraid. Hello and welcome back to the Story of Music Question Time, where, for the last time this series, we're tackling the questions and observations you've sent us. I was listening to a conversation between... Tom Service and Sue Perkins. I couldn't quite believe what I was hearing. Well, I couldn't understand what I was hearing because the speech pattern was at such a rate of knots. OK, so what was the relationship between what we heard there and that sort of flute piece and, and what you saw? OK, uh, well, I'm a flautist, albeit quite a bad one, and this is hell writ large on a stave. Okay, I the, the do first... wish that the intervals were filled rather more productively. Armed with those observations, I headed down to St George's Church in Bristol for an evening of Bach's Brandenburg Concertos. And in the interval, presenter Tom Service led a live discussion about the evening's performance with Sir Nicholas Kenyon, former head of Radio 3, and John Butt, who just so happened to be conducting and playing the harpsichord in the concert. So no break for him. As I made my way through the church's former crypt, now the venue's bar, I found a nervous-looking man in the corner... Producer Anthony Sellers was still waiting for his interval guests to arrive. At the moment, neither of the guests are here, because one will be on his way on the train, and another one's actually performing in the show, and therefore he's gone off to have a little bit of a a break. Now, uh, what I don't quite understand is this. John Butt is conducting it. So how is he going to take part in a live discussion between two parts of a concert he's conducting? For the first half of the interval, we're actually going to be playing a piece of music to the Radio 3 listeners. That gives the audience here time to have a comfort break themselves and to buy themselves a drink and then go back into the hall to hear the talk if they wish to. It also gives John, of course, the opportunity to do exactly the same thing. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight's performance will come out in 30 minutes. I'm now in one of the narrowest, uh, not say smallest corridors ever been in my life, somewhere in the basement of St George's, and a rather relaxed presenter is standing next to me. That must be purely acting. Tom, <laughs> absolutely, Tom Service. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely Roger. Well, thank you, that's very kind of <laughs> One of the things I would find very difficult as a presenter is if I'm sitting on a stage there, I'd want to please the audience I can see. And you've got to please the audience primarily that you can't see. What comes first? My feeling is that when you give that sense of event to the audience who've come to see the concert tonight, you will also be doing the right thing by the listeners at home. You listen to the thing because it's live and because you don't know what's going to happen next. And that is the sense of, I think, what you want to try and create. Now, can I look back and talk about some of the initiatives that you've been trying to do in the past? I mean, for example, in terms of the uh, interview features with Sue Perkins, A Question of Music Time, how do you approach that? Because it's a very different thing from the discussion you're going to do this evening. Those talks with, with Sue are actually very heavily produced programmes. I mean, what you hear on air in that 20 minutes is, is a distilled version of a much longer uh, conversation, which is uh, there's more questions that we can deal with in, in merely 20 minutes. Mind you, one listener, Thelma Edwards, says, that um, you and Sue Perkins were talking at such a rate of knots that you couldn't understand what you were saying. Can you see there's a problem? You want to get so much in, you do mm. start talking too quickly. There's a big issue there to do with, which is partly a personal thing for me. Uh, my brain works incredibly fast, Roger, as you've noticed. Um, there's, there's also something to do with the grammar of the radio network that you're on, and I think, to me, it's the question of being different. I hope it appeals to people, um, but of clearly, if, if, if some people don't like it, well, that's going to happen. We're now backstage with about, I think, ten minutes to go at the most. And Tom Service, the presenter, has now been mic'd up. And I hope somebody, perhaps I'm being naive here, has actually got a radio to make sure that what they're uh, recording is being transmitted at the same time. And now Radio 3, live in concert from Bristol. It's presented by Tom Service. Thank you, Jonathan. Welcome to one of the jewels of early 19th century British architecture and acoustics, St George's Bristol. 
Well, the first part of the concert is over. Some of the audience are now going out to have a drink. But on the stage, the assistants are having to move a number of instruments and then presumably seats brought forward so that the interval discussion can take part in what? But eight minutes of time. It's one minute until we get the talk going. Hey, thank you, yes. How long do you want it to last for? Well, I think it should be about 13 minutes or whenever seems convenient for them. We're now backstage. The producer, Anthony Sellers, here is just giving his last minute instructions. The CD, which is being played here at the outside broadcast, has got, what, 15 seconds to go now? And very shortly they'll be moving across. Ten, Ten seconds. So, John Buck playing the Greg Thank Howell organ at the University John. of California, Berkeley, in that recording of Johann Sebastian Bach's Trio Sonata Number no. 4 for organ. Well, before the second half of the Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment's old Bach programme, I'm delighted to be joined on stage by tonight's harpsichordist and director, John Butt himself, and Sir Nicholas Kenyon, managing director of the Barbican Centre. Can I get two small mulled wines? Tonight's interval discussion here in Bristol is, of course, just one of many ways in which Radio 3 tries to cover the interval between live broadcasts. The man who oversees this interval programming is Matthew Dodd. He's head of speech programming and presentation for Radio 3. We've got live music five nights a week, so there's actually many different things that we can do with the interval. But what assumptions can you make about the audience at home? Is it continuing to sit there and to listen? Well, I, I mean, I would say we don't always make assumptions that everyone's just sitting there to listen for the whole of the concert anyway. I mean, people listen to the radios, we know, in a different way. And, of course, the great thing about radio is that even if people did want to go to the kitchen, put the kettle on their cup of tea, they can carry on listening to the programme, can't they? Well, the interval discussion is now over. You can hear the clearing up going on, and the producer, I think, is a vast relieved person. Now all he has to worry about is the second half of the concert, and that really is in the hands of the conductor, so he can rest easy. Some divine bark to elevate our thoughts. Ah, you should have been there. Please be here at the same time next week. Goodbye. Those awkward intervals in Radio 3's live concerts. My feeling is that when you give that sense of event to the audience who've come to see the concert tonight, you will also be doing the right thing by the listeners at home. But first, the BBC ship has a new captain on the bridge. He left 12 years ago as plain Tony Hall and returned this Tuesday as Lord Hall of Birkenhead, a crossbencher ennobled because of what is widely regarded as an outstanding period running the once-troubled Royal Opera House. He calmed the turbulent waters of Covent Garden, but such storms are as nothing compared to the tsunamis that periodically smash into Broadcasting House. Seemingly undaunted, the new Director-General chose the scene of his predecessor's career suicide, or was it murder? The Today Studio and its Inquisitor-in-Chief for his first... ...forecasting, and I'm looking forward to him doing a good job, really. Now, I think one of the great... No, no, that's exactly the point. That yeah, is what yeah, they were saying, but they're not interested in <laughs> whether the BBC grows yeah. and becomes a mega organisation. But they where I, I... I'm Marsha Hill from London. Much as we all like John Humphreys using this aggressive style when he's questioning people that the rest of the silent majority of the country is angry with, Tony Hall hasn't done anything yet to make the rest of us angry. Our thanks to Gordon, Rob and Marsha for getting in touch. Now, we weren't impertinent enough to ask their ages before recording their comments. We wouldn't want to pigeonhole them in that way. But Radio 4 has been charged by the BBC Trust to attract younger listeners, or what is known in the trade as replenishers, replace first broadcast interview. As you would expect, John Humphreys interviewed his new boss with great respect, indeed, deference. I can then tell you whether the money we've got is too much, too little, well, I doubt it'll well, be Well, you've that. got a pretty clear or, or idea. Whether... You've been thinking about it for many months now. You were in the organisation. The thrust today. of the new DG's message was that, yes, the BBC had had a difficult time recently, but that it had learnt the lessons of the Savile Affair and was now intent on winning back the public's trust. Tony Hall also talked of the need for BBC management to foster excellence and creativity. Now, there's a novel idea. 
Management is a creative, or should be a creative uh, profession, where you are enabling people to do great things. A catalyst. The new DG got a sympathetic ear from most feedback listeners, but some were less than impressed with the interview itself. I'm Rob Bancroft from Bridgewater in Somerset. I was appalled at John Humphrey's interview with Tony Hall on this morning's Today programme. It wasn't so much an interview as a one-sided rant from John Humphreys in which he occasionally allowed Tony Hall to comment before interrupting his answer. What the future of the BBC looks yeah, like... Yeah, but you're ducking in, the question about um, money. In, you're, in you're 2022. Seen, you're, you're, now, you're, when I've done that, John, when I've done that, John... I thought Tony Hall did pretty well to get his point across because it felt as if John Humphreys had an agenda and he wasn't really willing to allow Tony Hall to make his point. I'm Gordon Petherbridge and I live in North Buckinghamshire. I thought it was a good interview in many ways and certainly Tony Hall acquitted himself well, fending off some of John Humphrey's attacks, if I can put it that way. And obviously he's a highly experienced man in Brooklyn. This is a download from the BBC. To find out more and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk. Mark Twain once said, Age is an issue of mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter. Radio 4 has relatively few listeners under 34. Does that matter to radio schedulers and strategists like Radio 4's Dennis Nolan? About half of all listening to Radio 4, in terms of the number of hours listened to, is by people over 65. I'd have to say that our absolute priority is to focus on the very demanding expectations of the older audience. More from Dennis Nolan and a specially convened listeners panel later. And the calm before Vivaldi's storm. How best to fill 